received the royal scepter, the ensign of kingly power and justice. Receive the rod of equity and mercy. Be so merciful that you be not too remiss. So execute justice that you forget not mercy. O oh God, the crown of the faithful, bless we beseech thee this crown, and so sanctify thy servant Elizabeth, upon whose head this day thou dost place it for a sign of royal majesty. There's lots of symbolism and ritual in royalty. But where does it come from? That's the question. During the coronation service of Queen Elizabeth II, the narrator mentioned that elements of the proceedings were so old that history could not fathom them. Well, this obviously implies that the symbolism reaches back farther than the origins of Christianity. It also means that the ceremony is not wholly Christian, even though it appears so on the surface. Indeed, the name Britain does not come from the Hebrew, but from the Phoenician. In fact, the Hebrew language comes from the Phoenician. The name Britain derives from Baratana, a name which uh, referred primarily to the sea goddess of the maritime Phoenician Irish peoples. This name can also be rendered Bharat, which was a name of India, and also Para, Prat, and Parat, etc. Baratana contains the syllable Ana, meaning heavens. The symbol of the cross can be seen on the early Phoenician coins, confirming that it is not Christian in origin. America is meant to have nothing to do with royalty and aristocrats and oligarchs, and yet here, on the seal of California, we find the very same emblem, the very same symbol of Baratana that's used as an emblem for the British Isles and the British royalty. A close look at uh, Baratana's shield shows a winged goddess with uh, a horned headdress, another ancient pagan symbol. And when it comes to goddesses, we find that Ireland was named after three of them, Eri, Banva, and Fodla. We find that Sweden is named after the goddess Svea, and Scotland was named after the Egyptian queen, Scota or Scotia. Britain, as we said, is named after the goddess, Baratana. This practice of naming countries, continents, like Europa for Europe, of naming nations, cities and towns after female goddesses or queens, is pagan in origin. It was the habit of the Western Arya or Aryans, the world's foremost spiritual aristocracy. The traditions of the Arya, the Goths, and the Saka of old have been appropriated and cannibalized by their Atonist destroyers. The Byzantine, or Roman Empire's main symbol, was the same as the Masonic double-headed eagle. Masonry, Templarism, and royalty are well and truly connected. They are all branches of Egyptian Atonism.
Well, curiouser and curiouser. It is not surprising that Druidic symbols appear on the regalia of the British royals. The wand, the cup and the plate, or the disc, originated with the four sacred treasures of Ireland, which also gave rise to the four suits of the tarot and the modern playing cards. The eagle is Atonist, although it was originally an emblem of the Arya and the Goths of ancient Britain and Scandinavia. It was and has been a symbol of royalty from the earliest times, among the Irish, the Phoenicians, the Scythians, Sumerians, Hittites, and Egyptians. Here we see the double-headed eagle on a Masonic lodge in Yorkshire, England. The double-headed eagle can be seen on many Masonic lodges throughout the world. Here we see it again on Albert Pike's memorial in Washington, D.C. And we discussed Albert Pike and his uh, backers in part one of this program. Here we see the American Eagle and the emblems for Georgetown University. Which one controls the other, we ask? Wasn't George a famous king of England? And why are there stars and druidic oak leaves around a Jesuit emblem? The eagle stands for the capital letter A, the signature of Aton and the Atonists. As we saw in part one, most of the uh, regalia and symbolism of the Freemasons and the Knights Templars and the symbolism of royalty has to do with Egypt. Many Masons were the compass and rule. They uh, lionize and uh, revere uh, the Egyptian pharaohs, Tutmosis and Akhenaten, and they revere the symbol of the three, which of course originated with Druidism, but was certainly used to great effect in Egypt. The design of the pyramid, for instance, being based on the harmonies of three and four. And speaking of strange symbols, we might ask why there is a skull and bone symbol on the tunic of a member of the Knights of Columbus. This is a Jesuit Catholic order uh, created in the 1920s to which many U.S. politicians and public figures belong. In part one, we traced the history of the skull and bones and its parent orders of Europe. Here we see the lion, which is seen on the heraldry of England. It too is primarily Atonist. The Atonist solar eagle has been used by the United States and the Atonist lion by Britain. The MGM logo, the British East India Company logo, and the Knights Templar emblem, even the flag of Richard I, the so-called Lion Heart, seen there on the bottom right, became the symbol of England. And we note the fact that it's three lions, three again being the sacred number of Druidry. Above we see Akhenaten, the original King of the Jews, the original Lion of Judea. Now the lion was also considered a protector of sacred places. This included locales, hence the position of the Sphinx in Egypt. The whole of Egypt was sacred, and so the protecting lion is there, presiding over the land. But uh, sacred locales included buildings such as shrines, temples, government buildings, and stately houses. So it's strange that we should find the lion on British heraldry and on the door of number 10 Downing Street. Is there something sacred about this address? We're being told that there is. Here we see, as we did in part one, the image of the lion discovered at Amarna, the city of Akhenaten. And across the river from Amarna lay Malevi, the city of the Levites. The so-called Levites, Judites, or Israelites, were none other than the notorious Hyksos pharaohs of Lower Egypt. They were not a ragtag bunch of slaves, as generations of lying historians and clergymen have falsely proclaimed. Although it is possible that the Hyksos originated in western climes, they were enemies of the Egyptian Amonists and the British Druids. The story of the conflict between these contingents is detailed in our book, The Irish Origins of Civilization. 
Platonism or fascism? We ask a question, is there really a difference? According to the symbolism, there's no difference whatsoever. Here on Buckingham Palace, the symbols, the ancient symbols of the lion and the unicorn, they represent Leo and Cancer, the great gates. Let's turn to the coronation ceremony itself, to day one. Outside the gates of the palace is the roundabout that represents the celestial zodiac. The queen's carriage drives around the structure and proceeds along Pall Mall. Notice the pyramidical design right outside the gates of Buckingham Palace. Just like at Washington, D.C. and at other sacred cities, we find the sacred ancient symbols, and particularly we notice the Egyptian symbolism. The carriage makes its way to the entrance of Westminster Abbey. This building is not to be confused with Westminster Cathedral. Outside the abbey was the royal crest depicting a lion and unicorn. The pale white unicorn is an ancient symbol for the moon. It also represents the Judaic house of Ephraim, or more correctly, the followers of the Pharaonic house of Aton, symbolized by the red lion. The coat of arms is therefore an emblem symbolizing the elite Atonist dynasties and the lieutenants who have loyally served them throughout the generations. The royal carriage in which the queen rides represents the chariot. This identifies it with the northerly sign of cancer, known as the gate of birth. The coronation of Elizabeth was symbolically speaking a birth. Now cancer's opposite sign, Capricorn, was known as the gate of death. A stellar or astrological rite was covertly performed during the coronation ceremony of Queen Elizabeth II on June 2, 1953, in the sign of Gemini. She became queen of 16 countries and the most powerful head of state in the world. But she is merely a placeholder for another. After all, in the coronation ceremony, the queen is referred to as the maintenancer of the realm. Here we see King Edward's crown featuring Maltese crosses and the fleur-de-lis of the French Templars and the French royal houses and the crown surrounds the so-called cap of maintenance. The word maintain means to perpetuate or keep in order until some other event occurs or until the arrival of a sovereign of greater rank. Interestingly, the very word entertain also connotes the same idea to entertain in the interim before the main event occurs. But in whose name or place does the queen and her court preside and maintain the state as stewards or caretakers? Within Westminster Abbey hang the banners and pennants of the many knightly families owing allegiance to the royal families of Britain. These bear many ancient astrotheological motifs and we can also note the inverted crosses on the right-hand side uh, behind the banners. Here we see Phoenician images showing the raised hand that was later incorporated into the design for the flag of Northern Ireland. Allegedly, the raised red hand was a symbol of the O'Neill clan of Ireland, but in fact it long predates the time of the Gaelic conquest of Ireland. Here we see the hand as the crest of the uh, despotic and uh, wayward Winston Churchill, a man who couldn't make up his mind what side of the political spectrum he could find a home. Kabbalistic imagery is also used during the coronation ceremony. The queen is positioned at the center of six maidens or ladies-in-waiting. The form of the procession is reminiscent of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, which we can see on the right. The procession then passes through the second portal into the church towards the altar. The company pass along a blue carpet symbolizing water, the river of life, time or knowledge, etc. Interestingly, the word Hebrew, as we saw in part one, means the men of the river. 
passing through the inner door towards the altar, we see the red train of the queen held by her six ladies. This red train symbolizes the line of kings and queens historically preceding the queen. She is the end of the royal bloodline, the so-called dragon court that stretches back past the time of Akhenaten to even more distant ages. And as we saw, the lion, or sometimes the dragon or the serpent of the Habsburg dynasty to whom the queen is related. We saw that the Windsors are also related to the Bose Leon family and the Battenbergs and the saxe coburg Gothas and the Hanoveran House of Orange to the Savoys and Angevins and Capetians and the Guelphs who were known as the Black Venetian dynasties. The procession approaches the first set of steps. There are six to climb. This represents a star of David, or, more correctly, of Aton. After this ascent, the queen moves slowly towards the members of the Protestant clergy standing uh, before the altar in two thrones. On the backs of the robes of the bishops, we see the letters IHS. These letters are believed to represent Jesus Christ, but in fact they derive from the Irish god Iessa or Isus, as well as from the Grecian and Roman god Dionysus or Bacchus, upon whom the Christian Jesus was partly based. The queen approaches the clergyman and the altar. Above the altar, with the sacred emblems of royalty, is a balcony where the family members of the queen are seated. They rise in courtesy as she approaches. The red train is meticulously laid down, and she turns to the Bible. Beside her stand four knights with four swords. They represent the compass points. The symbolism of the sword is complex. It is primarily a Martian symbol, although it also connotes the intellect and the acquisition of knowledge. Here we see the Dindira zodiac, one of the most ancient zodiacs in the world. And it shows the twelve signs of the zodiac and the four cardinal points. This zodiac was dedicated to the female goddesses Hathor and Isis. We recognize the four knights or the four stewards, not only as the four directions of heaven, but as the four sons of Horus. There they are, in front of the pharaoh, in front of Osiris. There, beneath the seat of Osiris, we see the wavy lines of the water, the same idea as the blue carpet, which we saw in the procession. But there in front of the pharaoh, in front of the noble one, or the king enthroned, we see the four sons, so-called sons of Horus, which represent the four cardinal directions of heaven, perhaps the four elements, and also the four hemispheres of consciousness. The queen is presented for recognition. She moves towards the St. Edward's chair. At this time, the Archbishop of Canterbury will present her before the people for recognition. This is an astromantic ritual in which the Queen represents the moon and the Archbishop the sun. His light illumines or recognizes her as the sun does the moon. The chair of St. Edward is another ancient Irish symbol. It's the coronation seat of Tara and is of Atonist origins. It was used in Ireland after the Milesians, or the Atonists, conquered the land around 600 BC. During this astrological ritual, the Queen faces each of the compass points in turn, while the same question is proclaimed as to whether she is accepted as regent by those gathered at the four points of the world. The Queen is asked by the Archbishop if she will swear before the people to keep the promises she has made to rule her realms and territories with justice and rightness. The Queen answers, All this I promise to do. The Queen proceeds towards the altar to kneel and swear before God that she will keep her oath. She kisses the Bible, which appears to be opened at an early chapter. Immediately after the Bible is removed, another book is brought forth in which she signs her name. After being addressed by the Scottish minister, 
the queen has her crimson robe removed. She rises and proceeds toward St. Edward's chair behind a knight carrying a sword. This is the moment before the anointing. During the televised uh, coronation, the narrator described the anointing ceremony as a moment so old that history can scarcely go deep enough to contain it. This curious description tells us that the rite preceded the time of Christ. That is what is being implied subtextually. And we may ask, what dynasty or empire known to anoint its kings and queens was so old that history itself cannot fathom it? Is the narrator referencing and suggesting pre-Diluvian empires? The queen anointed, blessed, and consecrated, said the narrator of the televised uh, ceremony in 1953. There it is, the chair of St. Edward, the Irish seat of kings, that arrived in England by way of Scotland, and it stands upon four Atonist lions. The back of the chair is suggestively pyramidical. On the right we see the updated, remodeled chair with the symbol of um, England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland and above it the pyramid with the circle inside of it. Irish and Egyptian symbolism. We see the Tudor roses and we see the Knights of Malta cross on top of the crown. And talking of thrones, long before the throne of the lion was used, we have the goat throne, used by kings and priests long before the symbol of the lion became a symbol of royalty. As Frank Higgins in his ancient Freemasonry says, the god Horus was often represented with the horns of both a ram and a goat. And as we saw in part one, the horned animals were sacred to the ancient Arya. Here on the pictures on the right we see the Knights of Malta cross or the cross we see the goat or gazelle like creature and on the image above we see the bull and below the bull we see the goat the little goat standing beside the seated dignitary the astrologer kings the priest king and as we saw the western aria they were the Phoenicians the Goths and the early Scythian Gaels. They all worshipped the horned animal. In particular, they revered the goat and the stag. The very name Scythian comes from Saka, from which we derive such uh, terms as sacred and sage. The syllable S-A-C and also Sak or Zak connoted the stag. The syllable appears in the word Saxon. This word originally denoted the sages and not the men of the spears. The syllable appears in names such as Isaac. This is correctly rendered ish sak, meaning man of the Saka, man of the sages, the Magi, the prophets, or the wise ones. Well, does this imply that the Old Testament characters Isaac, Jacob, and Abraham, who allegedly entered Egypt from Babylon, were in fact Western Scythians? In our mind, it does indeed imply that. And we always have to remember that the lies told to us about our exceptional megalithic ancestors are with, really without number. The lies disseminated about the Arya are also most pernicious. The very word Aryan has been thoroughly and deliberately misinterpreted. It referred not to a race, but to a caste. Specifically, it referred to the intellectual, spiritual, and moral status of any human being, regardless of their racial background. In Proto-Indo-European, the root is Aryo. In Iranian, the rendition is Asha. In Hindi, the root was Urta. In Greek, the renditions were Arete, meaning virtue, or Aristos, meaning best, like in Aristotle, the philosopher, and Ortho, meaning orthodox. In Latin, it was Rectus, or Erectus, meaning upstanding, right, or true. In German, it was Recht, meaning right. It also appeared as Reich, or more correctly, Areich, as in the names Rick or Arik, meaning rich or high, 
like the names Richard and Eric, etc. In English, it appears as right, and also as terms such as Aries, Art, Aristocracy, Arable, Area, and Harris. In Sanskrit, it was Arya, meaning kind, favored, excellent, or devoted. Secondary meanings are Lord, Master, Noble, Respected. The root appears in personal names, such as Aryabhata and Aran, and in numerous place names such as Benares, Ara, Aryavarta, Sumeria, Bulgaria, Armenia, Iran, Ireland, and Erik. In Origins and Evolution of Religion, Albert Churchward wrote, It is stated on a parchment found in a brick wall in the foundations of Dendera at the time of King Pepi, the Great Pyramid was built by the followers of Horus. The stellar cult people were the followers of Horus in the same sense as the Christians are followers of Christ. The architect who drew the plans was Nu Er Nub Ari, and his name his title was the Keeper of the Secrets. Now the Irish stag god was known as Hearn, and also Cerninos. The word Hermes comes from the Irish Hearn. Hermes was the Greek god of wisdom and secret knowledge. The horns that were once the symbol of divinity, spiritual wisdom, and mystical rank can still be seen in the spiked crowns worn by monarchs. In the Bible, we hear of Jesus and his so-called crown of thorns. Is this yet another cryptic reference to Druidism in the scriptures? Certainly. After all, the Druids employed the idea of a cruciform tree thousands of years before the advent of Christianity. Their son king, who was uh, hung on a tree of life, was Iessa, or Isus. The fairy word God derives from got, a word that originally meant the goat. Here he is, Hearn the Hunter, the ancient stag god of Druidism, wearing the original crown of thorns. The serpent and torque serve as his ring and rod. These are the key symbols of royalty, but spiritually they represent a biunity, the nucleation of the masculine and feminine polarities, and the unification of microcosm and macrocosm. They represent the so-called chemical wedding of the alchemists and mystery school adepts. The bracelet or torque of the prehistoric hern appears during the Queen's ceremony. During the anointing and consecration, four knights of the Order of the Garter bring a canopy over the seat and over the Queen. At this time, shielded from public view, the Queen is spoken to by the Archbishop of Canterbury. What passes between the two is not known. This scene was edited from the televised record. The Queen is head of the Knights of the Garter that was allegedly founded in the 14th century by Edward III. She wears the Order's tunic here and the emblem with the solar rays and red cross. Of course, in Part 1, we thoroughly discussed not only the symbolism of the red cross and its origin, but of the blue belt or garter that surrounds it. We also discussed the symbolism of the solar rays. Here are some crests and emblems of the Order of the Garter, carved for the Queen and on display at the palace. Note the owl, the serpent, and the phoenix, symbolizing Akhenaten. Of course, the serpent is a symbol to be found on the medical corporations, and the owl also, and it's the symbol of the Bohemian society, is connected to the, uh, the Roman god, goddess Minerva. The symbol of the blue garter, as well as the red cross symbol, referred to as St. George's cross, belonged to the Egyptian god Set. He was worshipped by the Hyksos pharaohs, the Shasu or, sh or shepherd kings, who during and after the time of Akhenaten became the Atonists. The Atonists conquered Britain approximately 600 years BC. This is the reason why Egyptian symbolism appears on so much British and European heraldry. The Lunar Queen becomes the Solar Queen. After being anointed, 
Elizabeth is clothed in a golden robe. She resumes her place on the chair and is presented with an unsheathed jeweled sword. The female queen takes the sword of Mars from the male knight. This interaction between the queen and knight is a key aspect of the ceremony. Its secret is revealed by way of an understanding of astrology and tarot. On the bottom left we see a tarot card named the Queen of Swords, corresponding with this aspect of the ceremony. The image of the royal lady holding the Martian sword can be seen in the tarot card named the Queen of Swords. This court card is also associated with the sign of Libra. Now Libra is the seventh sign of the Twelve. Importantly, it is the direct opposite of the sign of Aries. Aries is ruled by the planet Mars, and the symbol of Mars is, as we have said, the sword. Moreover, the sign of Aries is especially revered by Atonists. After all, it was during the age of Aries, approximately 1400 BC, that Pharaoh Akhenaten instigated the exclusive worship of Aton. Egypt was brought to wreck and ruin due to his fanaticism. Eventually, after 17 years of religious despotism, the crazed pharaoh was exiled. The queen represents the feminine Libra because of this sign's astrological opposition with the masculine Aries. The coronation is, therefore, not only an astrological rite, but an alchemical one. It is a form of hieros gamos, or chemical wedding. The archbishop approaches and says, With this sword do justice. The tarot card which corresponds to the sign of Libra is known as justice, and it is card number 11. The queen stands and walks towards the altar to return the sword. She resumes the throne, and the archbishop then brings forth the bracelets of sincerity and wisdom. As we saw, these bracelets again originate from Irish mythology. And according to one legend, Moses gave his own bracelets to a Gedel, the son of Noel, the Milesian, or Atonist, who brought them to Ireland after leaving Egypt. The ceremonial bracelets are given to the Queen as bonds between her and her people, and also as symbols of protection, embracing you on every side, defending you against all enemies, bodily or ghostly. So here we have an intensely occult ritual in which many of the actual rites are to do with protection, protecting the queen against all sorts of uh, attack, against all sorts of enemies in this world, in the incarnate world, and in the discarnate world, and the spiritual and astral planes. The queen is then adorned in the golden imperial robe it is another symbol of protection. Immediately afterward, she is also presented with the orb, which is the world under Christ's dominion, and the ring of sapphire and ruby. In her right hand, she holds the scepter of kingly power and justice. And in her left hand, she holds the rod of equity and mercy. This part of the right corresponds with the Kabbalistic schemata of the tree of life, and its masculine and feminine pillars, known as mercy and severity. These pillars are the Jachin and Boaz of masonry. The central path on the Tree of Life is made up entirely of feminine paths, as they are called. This central pillar, named Equilibrium, would be the body of the Queen herself, as we can see in the tarot card on the top, in the center, card number two, the High Priestess. We see the black and white pillars of Boaz and Jackin. We see the body of the female goddess. We see the pomegranate tree behind her. We see the number two. And we see the cross. Then, on the extreme right, we see the last card of the tarot, the uh, dancing female holding the two scepters or wands in exactly the same way as the queen is holding the two scepters or wands. And about her, 
as we can see in this card that's called the world, we see the four cardinal figures again, the four cardinal points. Now Albert Pike has something monumental and fascinating to say about the obelisk. In the Book of Enoch, he said, in speaking of the fallen angels, it is said, the name of the first is Yakun. He it was who seduced all the sons of the holy angel, and causing them to descend on earth, led astray the offspring of men. And the name, as Yakain, is fitly represented by a phallic column. Well, Yakun is obviously the Jakun, or Jakin, one of the pillars at the gates of Solomon or Aton's temple. We see these two stately pillars at the portals of all Masonic lodges and at important government buildings. These phallic altars to Lucifer, or Aton, can be found in most civic centers of the world as the obelisk, the tower, or a single erect stone monument. They stand in the center of prominent city squares and near important banks, churches, and educational institutions. The very word phallic comes from phallos, which means white or bright, and it's akin to phaos, that also means light. Albert Pike said, By the very name, it, the phallus, was connected with the sun. So where we have the solar symbols, we also have the phallic symbols. And the great phallic obelisk represented the fallen angel, the one who led men astray. And these phallic columns are to be found in the most important cities of the world and very, very close to the houses of government and religion. Here is the front cover of Sir Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, featuring the Masonic Jackin and Boaz. Here we have the Jackin and Boaz with the Egyptian pyramid in Israel. So again, the obelisk, the phallus of Lucifer, god of light, a cardinal atonist symbol, and now we have some idea of why it would have been incorporated into civic design in this particular way. Well, the idea of two pillars is not Jewish, but Egyptian. As said, Jackin and Boaz are based on the esoteric, so-called Kabbalistic tradition, and on the Tree of Life's pillars entitled Mercy and Severity. These terms apparently also refer to two ancient symbols of royalty, namely the crook and flail of the pharaohs. Egyptian pharaohs bore the symbol of the crook and also the flail or whip. This symbol of the flail connoted self-mastery and not dominance over others, as lying experts contend. Interestingly, the Hyksos pharaohs were known as the shepherd kings. The king of Egypt was regarded as a seer. He was the shepherd. This term distinguished him as a master astrologer, because the flocks were the stars of heaven. On Queen Elizabeth's shoulder, there is a, what appears to be two tassels, but which may be, in fact, a figurative Egyptian flail. It's a case of old pharaohs and new pharaohs. It's a case of meet the new boss is the same as the old boss. And what's more, we see the ring and the rod in exactly the same way as we saw in the ancient picture of Hearn the Hunter, in the Sumerian, Babylonian, Assyrian images of the goddess Lilith, who holds them, and also in the priest kings of ancient Sumeria and Babylon, who held the same symbols of royalty, the sphere and the rod, the ring and the rod, the one and the zero. In Genesis 49, chapter 10, we read, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nations is his. So again, an idea of waiting, uh, an idea of one who is to come, and the importance of the scepter. Of course, we find the royal scepter not only in the House of Lords, Trouble, troublesomely, we find it in the House of Commons. Ultimately, the House of Commons cannot open without the right of placing 
the Queen's Mace. The oligarch has the power, regardless of what the common public are led to believe. Everything is commissioned under the name of royalty and oligarchy. Now the Archbishop raises the crown high above the Queen's head before setting it in place. Suggestively, nothing organic exists during the ceremony, and men alone undertake the main ceremonial duties. That's right. The entire ceremony is indoors. There are no animals, there are no plants, and women do not take part in any of the main ceremonial duties. Here again we see the crown and the cross, which Christians uh, would have us believe originates uh, with early Christianity. But of course, a little study tells us the opposite tells us that the cross is hardly unique to Christianity or modern royals. We find it on the symbols of the Goths, the Picts, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Irish, and of course the Phoenicians. Now once crowned, the Queen, while adorned in the golden imperial robe and while carrying the two scepters, goes to another set of stairs. She begins to ascend five stairs to her throne to assume full possession of her kingdom. Now five is the number of transcendence. It signifies mastery over the four elements of fire, water, air and earth. Moving to the fifth level in anything symbolizes a form of crucifixion, to die to the four, to die to the cross and transcend to the quintessential level. In English the letter E represents this quintess quintessential level that is known uh, by the Greeks as Epsilon, the fifth letter of the alphabet. That's right, six stairs, then five. You think it's Masonic? Well, you've just graduated, because it is. Here, on a Masonic frieze, are the uh, idiosyncratic symbols, the emblems of Freemasonry, like we see on so many lodges, the six-pointed star, the five-pointed star the number six and the number five, the number five and the number six, the two trees stylized to look like columns, the phallic idea, we see the uh, compass and rule, we see the letter G, which we discussed thoroughly in part one, we see the face of the sun, and we see the moon, and of course the queen ceremony it totally employs the astrological and astrotheological elite motifs, of the coming together of the sun and the moon. We see the eye, not the eye of Horus, but the eye of Aton. We see the tools of masonry, and we see the Pythagorean uh, squares. It's all there for the eye to see and to decode. And the endless emphasis on light and the sun. Now that the Queen has sworn to uphold the teachings of the Protestant faith and to support and protect its clergymen, three bishops go down on their knees in homage before her. At this point she is made supreme over her male subjects. And we want to really meditate on that term subject. In the early Babylonian stele, we see the sun disk, we see the four directions and the three attendants uh, to the enshrined king within his sacred precinct. There's nothing new about the queen's ceremony and the traditions and the rites and rituals that we see uh, going on in it. Now above the priest king's head are the symbols of the planets and stars. The temple stands upon the water symbolized by the wavy lines. As we saw earlier, the queen's procession moved along a blue carpet. Moreover, the very abbey Westminster Abbey is situated right on the river Thames, or Tammuz, the river of Thomas, the river of time. The Queen is then approached by four more subjects, her husband the Duke of Edinburgh, her uncle the Duke of Gloucester, her cousin the Duke of Kent, and finally the Earl Marshal of England. Each kneel and kiss her on the left cheek. Now in the first, second and fourth case, the dedication to the Queen is spoken aloud. In the case of the Duke of Kent, it is read silently 
from a paper presented in front of him by one of the bishops. The photo on the right is slightly blurred, but the paper being held in front of the Duke of Kent by the bishop can be plainly seen. Now the Duke of Kent is the head of the Freemasonic Orders of Britain. It is therefore very suggestive that his statement and proclamation before and to the Queen is silent and secret. The narrator of the coronation service passed by this specific episode without a comment. Perhaps it is also suggestive that the Duke of Kent is the third in line to approach the Queen, the number three being sacred to Freemasons, as it was to the ancient Druids. Of course, the skeptic will say, it got nothing to do with Freemasonry. Well, that's what you're bound to think without investigation, without research, and without uh, an open mind. On the contrary, it got everything to do with Freemasonry. But it's more pernicious even than that. The, royal, the royals expect their subjects to bow or kneel before them, do they not? Well, the boss man expects you to bow and kneel before them if they had their way. But symbolically bowing low the head to anyone actually signifies death. It signifies that one is headless before their liege lords. In Latin, the word head is caput, as the elite Capetian dynasty, which we discussed in program one. The word capitulation connotes cutting off a head, and that is what one symbolically does when they bow before monarchs or political dignitaries. One is symbolically lower and lesser than the regent. One indicates that they surrender their selfhood and sovereignty. The same thing applies when the knees are bent or genuflected. This occurs, of course, when knighthoods, knighthoods are granted. Now the Queen removes her crown and she and Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, both kneel before the altar to receive communion, the bread and the wine. This is the final rite before the service ends and they rise to leave the church to meet the people outside. Prince Philip was made Duke of Edinburgh, a place which is, in the esoteric doctrine, considered the true Jerusalem. He is therefore the Duke of Jerusalem. But who are the Windsors? Well, the name of Windsor was adopted on July 17, 1917. The reason had to do with the fact that the present British royals are German by ancestry. Their actual dynastic names are Germanic. Of course, this did not sit well with the men and women of England who were forced into war with Germany on two occasions. The royals sitting on the thrones of Britain did not want it widely known that the enemy in Germany was of their own blood and that the men and women were dying for nothing. The so-called Windsors are actually related to the house of saxe coburg gotha to Schleswig-Holstein-Soderberg-Glücksburg, to Oldenburg, which is Prince Philip's actual family, Oldenburg of Denmark, to the House of Wetton, to the House of Battenberg, which was later transmogrified into Mount Batten. They're related to Bose Leon, which is the Queen Mother's family. They're also related to the Guelph dynasty, which is sometimes rendered Welf with a W, and to Habsburg and Hanover. They're also connected to the Capetians, the Angevins, the Tudors, the Stuarts, the Plantagenets, the Savoys, the Medicis, and so on. Each house mentioned here can be researched online, at Wikipedia and at other sites. But rarely are such names used. The ruse of using the locale is preferred because it's the perfect cover. For example, we hear of the Duke of Kent and the Prince of Wales. The masses accept these titles as names and forget about asking vexatious questions regarding ancestry. Prince Philip is the grandson of Queen Victoria and is related to most of the current and former crowned heads of Europe, including seven czars. Geoffrey Steinberg, in his book The Largest Empire in the History of the World, speaking of this uh, Windsor family, he says these families constitute a financier oligarchy. They are the power behind the Windsor throne. They view themselves as the heirs to the Venetian oligarchy, which infiltrated and subverted England from the period 1509 to 1715, and established a new, more virulent Anglo-Dutch-Swiss strain 
of the oligarchic system of imperial Babylon, Persia, Rome, and Byzantium. And again, a look at the etymology reveals a great deal. The connotative meanings. Tudor, the house of Tudor. Could that be a corruption of the word tutor? The tutors, the literate ones, the ones who can read and write when the world was reeking with ignorance and illiteracy? Are they the teachers? Or are they the Tudor? Or the Judah? Is the word Tudor an anglicized, corrupt version of the term Judah? And was Judah the judges? The tribe of judges? Ultimately, as we showed in program one, Judah equals Aton. And the stewards, as we showed, are really the stewards, those who stand in place of one to come. Now we come to the end of the service, the end of the coronation ceremony. Six hours has elapsed, and the service ends, and the royal procession turns the way it came. Note that the queen's train is now black, not red. Black, red, and white are the three most important uh, colors in alchemy, in the alchemical process. Negredo is black, rubedo is red, and albedo is the white. They return to the palace. They emerge from Westminster Abbey after the six-hour-long coronation service. The Queen enters her carriage and makes her way back to Buckingham Palace, passing through Whitehall, Pall Mall, St. James's Street, and Piccadilly, through streets thronged with onlookers and regimented marching troops from every one of her territories. Now a closer look at the design of the royal carriage reveal, reveals the four lions again and the two-winged humanoid feature figures, one carrying the trident of Poseidon, god of the sea, of earthquakes, and of Atlantis. The trident was originally the symbol of Baratana, the Phoenician queen after whom Britain was named. And let's not forget again the tarot aspect of all of this, that the carriage represents card number seven, the chariot, moving through and back again through the gate of uh, birth. As the carriage approaches Buckingham Palace, the bemused, symbolically illiterate masses wait for the royal carriage to pass into the palace before rushing madly towards the gates to wait for the queen to appear on her balcony. That their fathers and sons died in many wars orchestrated by the Windsors and their European cousins does not dampen their patriotism in the least. The sky may cry, but they grin and wave their flags. Finally, the royal party emerge onto the balcony. At the palace, the women apparently move to the viewer's left, for the most part, and the men move towards the right. This arrangement again fits the Kabbalistic model of the masculine and feminine paths of the Tree of Life. And let's not ever forget the whole question of geometry, sacred geometry, earth geometry, geomancy, positioning, because unknown to the congregating hordes whose energy becomes a key factor, in civic rituals of this kind, the zodiacal Paul Mal, with its gates of birth and death, sits at the apex of a giant pyramid, a pyramidical design upon which Buckingham Palace is based. We see the letter A again for Aton and Akhenaten, the great sun king. It can clearly be seen from the air. Here's a close-up. The great gates, the gates of birth, and the uh, sphere, the fountain, and the pyramid. Here we see it at Washington, D.C. Are we to uh, imagine, are we to accept the notion that this is, uh, there's no similarity whatsoever, it's just coincidence? So we roll over and go to sleep and imagine it's just architectural uh, coincidence, an accident? Or are to put our thinking caps on and uh, look objectively and studiously and find out uh, the deeper aspects of all of this and why we see the uh, phallic column of Lucifer near to the great seats of government. The center of the circle in which the crowds patiently wait features three concentric circles. 
or three concentric circles, is the age-old symbol for Atlantis. These three circles are suggested in the Jewish menorah, and they're also featured in the U.S. Congress Groom, along with the twin fasci, that is. The symbols of Rome, symbols of Egypt, the symbols of the Atonists, the symbols of Atlantis. Here's a Masonic design for the so-called New Jerusalem. It's not three concentric circles, of course, but it certainly is three concentric uh, rectangles or squares. It's all Judaism. It's all Atonism. Masonry. And the royals, being members of these secret societies, know all about it. And many of the politicians that they themselves honor and put into positions of power and then go on to um, give awards to, these uh, creatures also know about this. They also serve uh, the masters behind the lodge door. And their interests may not, in fact, coincide with the best interests of humanity. Their new Jerusalem, their new world order, may not be something worth living in and certainly not worth sweating to build. Quite the contrary. The geographical positioning of Buckingham Palace, Pall Mall and Westminster Abbey is important also. Many of these sites in London stand on ancient Druidic sites and near to ancient Druidic emblems and sacred trees, as well as being astrologically positioned beneath important stars and constellations. During the months of May and June, the constellations of Scorpio are prominent in the early morning and evening sky. This sign, and that of Ophiuchus, the thirteenth sign of the zodiac, are important to the elite royals and to their lieutenants within religion and government. Ophiuchus is actually made from two constellations, namely Serpens and Serpentarius.